And if you're sitting there right now thinking they made five Ice Age movies, this is the place for you. I don't know what this video is. I know what this video is going to be, so I'm going to start there. Hi. Hello. My name is Haley Whipjack. You can call me Haley. You can call me Whipjack. You can call me Haley Whipjack. Whatever feels good for you. And I've had an idea in my brain kicking around for a long time. The basic conceit of this series would be looking at just the last installment of a media franchise. The last season of a really long-running show. The last movie of a big movie franchise. Something like that. And just judging that last installment as kind of its own piece of media, either with the context of the rest of the franchise or without the context of the rest of the franchise. I think no context is funnier, but it's not what's going to be happening today. I really want to do this idea with the last season of Supernatural sometime, uh, but I don't. That might be the end of me, so we'll see. I figured the best way to see if I actually liked this idea and execution was to start with a movie franchise and one I was sort of familiar with. So that's why today we are going to be talking about a very bad movie. Today I want to talk to you all about Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016. And the thing about Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 is I feel like most people are not aware that there are in fact five Ice Age movies. There are five Ice Age movies. I truly cannot wait to get into the nitty gritty of Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 with you. We're going to break down the whole plot. We're going to talk about its themes. We're going to discuss if it was a good movie. I already spoiled that one for you. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going to get really into it. We're going to get really into the meat of Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016. You and me as friends, as lovers. Probably not. But before we get into all that, I'm going to explain the context that I have for the Ice Age franchise going into this. And we're also going to talk a little bit about the first installment in the Ice Age franchise, Ice Age 2002. I watched the first Ice Age approximately a quarter of a million times as a child. It meant a lot to me. But uh, up until I rewatched it for this about a week ago, I had forgotten most of it, it turns out. Definitely saw the second Ice Age in theaters. Probably also saw the third Ice Age in theaters, and I've never seen the fourth Ice Age movie. And quite frankly, at this point, I don't intend to. So when I watched Ice Age 5, I didn't have the context of Ice Age 4, but honestly, I don't think I needed it. Again, we're gonna talk about all this. These characters meant a lot to me as a child, which might be part of the reason that I take Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 as such a personal offense. Like, a, it's like they're attacking me. Just as like a little taste, just to keep you with me here, Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 opens with Scrat, the squirrel, going to space. It opens with him going to space. So, so how do we get there? Let's start by talking about Ice Age 2002. Ice Age 2002 is the story of three traumatized men coming together and learning about the true meaning of family. That's it. That's the movie. That's what it's about. All of our main characters have some pretty complicated feelings about family, some pretty rough family histories, but they learn about the importance of the family that you choose and that that is still a valid way to live your life. That's, it's a good theme for a movie, and it's pretty clearly what it's about. And if you, like me, saw Ice Age a bunch as a child and then didn't see it again for many, many years, you might be thinking, that's not what Ice Age is about. Ice Age is about a baby and a sloth and some dodo birds and a big mammoth. Let me explain. But to begin, we have to meet our characters. Start off, we have Manny, the mammoth. What I'm gonna need you to do is pretend that you can really clearly see what's happening on the whiteboard for me, okay? Because if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, why didn't you just make the pictures bigger? I can't see that. You'll find out why later, okay? Patience. Manfred, Manny, the mammoth. His primary personality trait is grumpy old man. Secondary personality trait is protagonist. Uh, Manny is a pretty simple guy. Ice Age 2002 opens up with all of the animals going on their southern migration for the winter so that they don't freeze to death in the Ice Age. It's a good strategy, but Manny the Mammoth is not going south for the winter. For reasons that aren't fully explained, but we do find out later in the movie that Manny had a wife and child that died by the hands of human hunters. And we don't know how long ago that was. Maybe that was last winter or before this next winter had happened and he's not going south. 
for sad reasons. We really don't know. He's just not going. They play it off like he just doesn't want to be around people and he doesn't want to be around people because he's grieving and traumatized, I guess. But they it's not I he makes me sad. But the movie doesn't actually get into that. The movie is just like this is our big grouchy man who doesn't want to hang out with any friends. He doesn't want any friends and he doesn't want any people around him. He just wants to be all alone all by himself. What a silly mammoth. And he's not the most fun character in the world. He's usually the straight man in the situation, which is fine. You need one of those, especially because he's always next to Sid, which might be part of the reason he's always so grouchy. I love Sid, but Sid is kind of a lot. Speaking of, let's get to the man of the hour. It's Sid the Sloth. Sid. Sidney, they call him sometimes. I don't know if that's his name. We're just going to call him Sid. Sid's primary personality trait is stupid. He's our stupid funny man. He's our comic relief for most of the movie, and he's great at it. John Leguizamo crushing it as Sid the Sloth. Great performance. Sid's a real simple guy. He talks about how he doesn't see the point in mating for life. He's all about going with the flow. He just wants people to like him. He wants to be helpful. He wants to start fires. He's not good at it, but he wants to start the fires. He's great. Not smart, but great. Like I said, this movie starts with all of the animals getting ready or going on their southern migration for the winter so that they don't freeze to death in the Ice Age. And we meet Sid after his entire family abandoned him, left without him, and hopes they will never see him again. And it's not even because, like, Sid's lazy and slept in or anything. It's implied they all woke up early specifically to sneak away so that he could not travel with them and perhaps wouldn't migrate at all. That's terrible. <laughs> And I do firmly believe that Sid's family expected to never see him again because, like I said, Sid's primary personality trait is stupid. Uh, I really do think that he would just start walking north for a while and then wonder why it's not getting any warmer and then eventually just freeze to death in the Ice Age. Sid, left to his own devices, cannot survive. That's not me being mean to Sid. That's just true. And I know it's true because the first time that Sid meets Manny, Manny has to save his life from angry rhinoceroses because Sid eats the last dandelion of the season and they're very mad at him and they chase him with the intent of murder. And Manny has to save him. And of course, Sid, abandonment issues and a family that never liked him much less would have saved his life from rhinoceroses. The sloth immediately imprints on the big mammoth and decides they're going to migrate south together. Manny disagrees because he's a grumpy old man who doesn't like anybody. However, while the two of them are together, they come across a human woman who is about to drown in a river who gives them her baby. This has never made sense to me. She looked at these two and thought, perfect. Whoops, they have a baby now. Uh, neither of them want to keep it. Manny, I think, just wants to leave it there. Uh, but Sid picks, picks him up, picks up the baby, and decides that he's going to get the baby back to the rest of the humans so that he can be back with his family. Because family is important. So that's their plan. Return baby to people. You know how I called Sid the man of the hour? I, I lied. This is my man of the hour. <laughs> Diego is a saber-toothed tiger, and I love him. Diego's primary personality trait is that he's always right. <laughs> he is trying his absolute best. He is trying so hard. <laughs> Things Diego wants. Approval. So what about his family baggage? Did he escape having family baggage? Of course not. Diego's family is a bunch of baby killers. <laughs> and I understand that he's a predator, okay? He's a big scary predator. He's definitely eaten a baby or two in his time. That's fine. I get it. Diego's family specifically hunts down specific babies for murder. <laughs> it's a really cool children's movie. Diego's father figure wants revenge on the human settlement because some of the humans killed some of the saber-toothed tigers for their meats and pelts, and now they want revenge for that transgression. For some reason, the way he wants revenge is by getting and killing the baby. He doesn't want the, the grown men that did the crime. So Diego is sent out to find the baby and return it to the pack. 
Diego needs to return the baby alive, and he needs to do it soon because his family is impatient and mean to him. Crimes against babies aside, uh, Diego's baggage is that for him, love is conditional. Uh, love comes from completing tasks, comes from doing what you are told, and if you don't measure up, you are not worthy of love, of affection, of your place in the pack. So Diego meets up with the other two because they have the baby he needs <laughs> to complete his tasks in order to get the love and acceptance from his family. So that's where he comes in. <laughs> so here they are, our three little adventure boys. Uh, obviously, there's other characters. There's the humans. There's the baby. The baby has a name. Also, they never say it in the movie. Uh, it's Roshan. The things you find when you peruse the Ice Age wiki. A normal place to be. There's Diego's pack. There's Sid's family we never see. There's the rhinoceroses. There's a bunch of dodo birds who do taekwondo and are doomsday preppers, which is perfect. Stunning. Movie should have won awards just for that. But the entire core of the story is these three getting to know each other, bonding, figuring each other out, and eventually becoming a herd. They call it a herd instead of a family. They don't call it a pack because Diego has a pack, but they call it a herd. They're just a little herd. Oh, I love them. And part of the herd actually is the baby who develops his own relationships with these three. Sid is the baby's surrogate mom for a little while. Uh, Diego is the baby's favorite. <laughs> At one point, they even witnessed the baby's first steps. Uh, while they're all sitting around a little campfire together. And he goes right for Diego, who's really encouraging the baby to walk towards the other ones because he doesn't see himself as worthy of the baby's trust. It's because at that point, his plan is still to kidnap the baby and deliver it to his family for murder. But the baby doesn't know that. The baby does not have any reason not to trust Diego based on Diego's actions. Uh, Diego just feels bad. It is amazing, actually, how unafraid the baby is of any of the three of them. I would be afraid of them now if I met them in real life. If it was, if there was a, a whole mammoth and a person-sized sloth and a tiger with teeth this long, I'd be afraid now. A six-month-old is just cool. I don't know. Of course, Diego does not end up giving the baby to his pack. He comes close. There's a whole moment where the other two realize that that's been his plan the whole time, and it's a whole mess. He comes close, but he doesn't do it because he can't do that to his herd. Also, by this point, Manny did almost sacrifice his life for Diego. He got squished by some rocks pushing Diego out of the way. Uh, he didn't die. He's fine, but he was ready to sacrifice his life for this guy he just met who's been like a little rude to him. This is probably the first time that Diego's ever been shown that kind of unconditional sacrificial love. And it shows that Manny really has uh, gotten to see these folks as family and as people he's close to after at the beginning, we saw that he didn't even want to migrate with anybody. So it doesn't have any big sacrificial moments, but he is sort of the glue holding the other two together for a good chunk of the movie, other than the baby. But we can't put all of that responsibility on the baby. When Diego decides not to give up the baby to his pack, his pack decides they'll take these two instead. The drama! So then Diego has to choose, and he sacrifices himself for Manny. There's like a real fake out. They really want you to think that Diego died. He doesn't. He's okay. He's perfect. But they really want you to think that he did. And like the tiger that we met at the beginning of the movie would have never done that. The growth. The character. The way that people can change you for the better. Diego, laying on the ground, dying, has tearful goodbyes with these two and with the baby, and then they set off to finish their mission of returning the baby back to his family. Now, when it turns out that Diego didn't die, he reunites, and the three of them all return the baby to his father, to his village, to his family, and they decide that the three of them are all going to migrate south together. That's the end of the movie. And it's fine. <laughs> the movie's not some grand masterpiece. Okay, I love it. It's super nostalgic for me. I really liked re-watching it for this video, for this little project. I had a great time. Um, the animation is from 2002. Uh, some of the jokes are from 2002. But overall, it holds up. It holds up. I'm not going to say run, don't walk to rewatch Ice Age, but I think if you liked it as a kid, it's worth a rewatch now.
I know you're looking at my whiteboard and you know who I forgot. I know you know who I forgot. The entire time that this story about blood family versus chosen family and bonding and healing is happening, um, there's also just this squirrel who wants to put his nut in stuff. His name is Scrat, and he wants to put his nut in stuff. Scrat is some sort of prehistoric squirrel, and his primary personality trait is acorn and relentless determination. This man has got to put his nut in stuff, no matter the personal physical, emotional cost, it's going in stuff. Sometimes it goes into a glacier and splits the whole thing open. Sometimes it goes into a tree right before the tree gets struck by lightning. Oh no, Scrat. That, that's, that's it. That's it. He has a single interaction with our adventure boys where he plays charades to let them know what he's seen, but what he's seen was a group of saber-toothed tigers and it would have given away Diego's whole game. So Diego like punts him across the world. That's, that's it. That's what Scrat does in this movie. You understand why he was not on the whiteboard earlier. (laughs) To reiterate, decent movie. Good music. Good themes. I love the characters. Still. Worth a rewatch, I would say. Ice Age 2002, worth rewatching. But it wasn't some cultural touchstone. And more than that, it wasn't an open-ended story, really. The emotional arcs of the characters were done. They had their issues. They found some resolution to them. You had the idea, of course, that there were going to be more stories. They literally end the movie walking off to migrate. But there's not this idea that there's some great piece of their story missing. All that to say, I don't know if I would have made a second Ice Age movie. And I like the second Ice Age movie. I rewatched it not that long ago. I think I watched it a lot of times as a kid. But I don't think personally I would have made a second Ice Age movie. I probably also wouldn't have made a third Ice Age movie. And I definitely wouldn't have made a fourth. I know that for certain because I've never even seen the fourth. You know how many Ice Age movies I certainly wouldn't have made? I have been procrastinating in getting this recorded and putting out this video. I have been. And the wild thing about procrastinating is in the time it's taken for me to record this, they have released another Ice Age movie. When I started this project, there were only five Ice Age movies. There is now a sixth Ice Age movie. We're not going to get into the sixth Ice Age movie here because um, I don't actually think it counts, and let me explain why. Ice Age 5, Collision Course 2016, came out in 2016. Ice Age 6, Adventures of Buck, came out in 2022. But it did not get a theatrical release. It's a Disney Plus exclusive. And if you check out the cast list, nobody came back for it. At time of recording, Ice Age 6, Adventures of Buck 2022, has a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes, which I would love to say is part of the reason that it doesn't count, except that Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 has an 18% on Rotten Tomatoes. So do I think that Ice Age 5 officially killed the Ice Age franchise? Yes, I do. I think there's a reason it took them six years to put out another movie and nobody even wanted to come back for it. Nobody, nobody wanted back after all of this. <laughs> So when I opened the video up by saying, can you believe that there's five? There's six. There's six Ice Age movies. But we're going to talk about this one because I've watched it three times. So let's get into this. Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 has so many characters in it. And yes, that's because there was Ice Age 2, Ice Age 3, and Ice Age 4 to take the time to gather more characters. However, it's egregious. Hermes is here now. We still have our good, good adventure boys. We still have Manny and Sid and Diego and Scrat. Is this going to be distracting for you? Manny, Sid, Diego, Scrat, all still here, all still theoretically present, but they have so many friends. And there's no time to get into it quite like the present. So we're going to start adding to all of their friends by talking about Ellie. Ellie is girl mammoth. Ellie is very confident, brave, determined, stubborn girl mammoth. Ellie is Manny's wife. And I really did think that when we were saying that, like, the animals have wives, it was kind of uh, euphemistic almost. It's just us recognizing that that mammoth picked one other mammoth that is, like, their life partner. They're romantically involved. They have children. We do see, like, a Christian wedding in this movie. So I guess they really are married. I say Christian wedding. We have no proof of Ice Age Jesus, 
But the way the wedding is laid out is very how you would expect to see like a traditional Christian. We'll get into it. Are you good? Uh, Ellie was an addition to the franchise made in Ice Age 2. She's voiced by Queen Lativa. I think she really was a good addition, and I'm glad that she's stuck around. Also hailing all the way back from Ice Age 2 is Crash and Eddie. I forgot to mention that when we met Ellie, she thought she was a possum. And Crash and Eddie were her real biological brothers. They're not. She's a mammoth. But effectively, these are her brothers. She is their sister. They're family. Remember how the whole thing was like found family? Like, it doesn't matter if they're your biological family because you chose them. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Crash and Eddie do not get their own separate cards because they are effectively one character in two bodies. They don't really have distinguishing traits outside of each other. They're just two possums. And that primary personality trait that they share is comic relief, which is so good because we really don't have enough comic relief characters in the cast. Now, when a daddy mammoth and a mommy mammoth love each other very much, you get Peaches. Peaches is voiced by Kiki Palmer. She's super adorable. I love her. Her primary personality trait is independent. She's stubborn. She's confident. She's sweet. She's wonderful. I think it's really nice to see like a daughter character who really does have a personality. The thing that matters for the plot is that she's Manny's little girl. And who is stealing away Manny's precious little girl? Julian. Julian's great. Julian's great. Julian is affectionate. He's romantic. He's sensitive. He's in touch with his feelings. He wants to have a future with Peaches. He wants to travel the world with her and get married. They're engaged. Uh, but also a really big chunk of his personality is falls down a lot, doesn't know sports. And how could Mr. Falls Down a Lot, Doesn't Know Sports ever take care of Manny's little girl. If you can't tell, I'm absolutely enamored with this plot line. The fact that Julian falls down all the time also does make him a source of comic relief, which is so good because we really don't have enough comic relief in the cast. That's all our mammoths. We have four mammoths. A uh, big step up from the one that we started with, but it, that's okay. But it's not just Manny who brought in family and is trying to make his own family unit here. Sid found his grandma? I don't know what movie granny showed up in. Excellent news, I've just checked the Ice Age wiki and her actual name is Gladys, but everyone calls her granny and apparently she was also abandoned by the whole family. I wouldn't know. They didn't talk about it in this movie and I maybe they did in Ice Age 4. Haven't seen it. Granny's primary personality trait is old and her secondary personality trait is horny. And when you combine those two things together, you get a really good dose of comic relief character, which is great because we really don't have enough comic relief in the cast. We're still not done. There's more characters. Uh, also in this movie, Diego has a girlfriend, which it's not the vibe I got from Diego, but Shira is a sexy lady tiger. She was, I believe, a pirate introduced in the fourth one. Uh, she's very scary. She's peak predator. She's in a very healthy relationship with Diego the Sabertooth Tiger. They're a wonderful match. Shira's primary personality trait is that she's not in this movie. Shira and Diego's primary issue in this movie is that they both want kids, but they feel like kids are afraid of them. So they don't know how that's going to work out for their future. Now, if you recall our discussion about Ice Age 1, 2002, Diego's a great father. <laughs> Yes, the other kids in the valley are afraid of them. They're big, scary tigers. But Diego has a documented case of a child who was afraid of him, very quickly learned to trust him and trust him more than Sid, who's not scary at all, quite frankly. So I feel like that's something that he maybe should have explained to his girlfriend. I don't know what label they've put on their relationship, but it's probably something his life partner would have wanted to know. They're just worried that kids are scared of them. That particular plot line, barely addressed in the movie. And it's the only part I was interested in. So this is our starting lineup. This is all the characters we need to know before we get into it. We're gonna be adding more as we go. This is the first scene. Quick recap, we've got Manny. He's married to Ellie. Their daughter is Peaches. She's engaged to Julian. These possums are Ellie's brothers, which make them Manny's brothers-in-law and Peach's uncles. Sid, his grandmother is here. He and Manny are friends. They're also friends with Diego and his girlfriend Shira is here. Scrat is also in the movie, which means we are now ready to talk about the plot of Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016. <laughs> There may be points in this retelling where you think I am exaggerating 
or that I am lying to you. And I would just like to make it clear. This is all going to be a factual recounting of Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016 with some additional commentary because I just can't stop talking ever. This movie opens with a Neil deGrasse Tyson voiceover. Celebrity scientist Neil deGrasse Tyson opens up this bad, bad children's movie with a voiceover talking about how space was made as though it is some serious National Geographic documentary. Immediately weird vibes. Im immediately weird vibes. Now, it wouldn't be an Ice Age movie without starting off with Scrat. So it is weird that they started with Neil deGrasse Tyson, but then we do go to Scrat. By the time we watch Scrat fall into a random cave, only two minutes of the movie have passed, but that part's pretty much what we expected, right? Some weird slapstick with a squirrel. That's what they do with him. However, by the time five minutes of the movie has passed. Scrat, the squirrel, has fallen into that cave and put the nut that he has into something. Loves, loves putting the nut into stuff. Five movies and still all he wants is to put his nut in stuff. No character growth for him. Puts the nut in a thing. Lights, purple, sounds, ripples. He's in a spaceship. He's just activated an alien spaceship by putting an acorn on a piece of ice. He's in the spaceship. It takes off, flies out of an iceberg and directly into space. Scrat falls out of the spaceship. The nut falls out of the spaceship. Scrat's in a squirrel spacesuit. The nut is in a nut-shaped spacesuit. Scrat says, in English? Says, oh no, we've never heard him speak English before, and we will not hear it again. Scrat and the Nut, both in their custom designer spacesuits, hit a magic purple asteroid. And what does Scrat do? What does Scrat always do? He puts the Nut in the asteroid and breaks it. And a piece of it goes hurtling towards the Earth. And that's the first five minutes of the movie. It's just not how... I expected an Ice Age movie to go from my experience, but it's what they gave us. It's what they gave us. We get space monologue, space shenanigans, Scrat is in space, where he will remain, by the way. So much of this movie is just randomly cutting away to Scrat in space. So much time taken up by this, but fine. He's in space. There's an asteroid hurtling towards Earth. The very next scene is Crash and Eddie narrating a hockey game between Manny and Peaches. It's a little bit of a tone shift. And here comes Julian. Uh-oh, he doesn't know sports and falls down. <laughs> and then Peaches goes to hang out with her fiance because they're engaged and Manny gets sad because his daughter doesn't want to hang out with him. <gasps> yes, we are immediately entrenched in petty family drama right after Scrat was literally launched into space. Get ready for that weird juxtaposition the whole time. Manny is moping, but here comes Ellie and also Granny. I guess they're friends. I don't know. In the background, the possums get into a fist fight. Ha ha! Julian, sweet, sweet boy, gives flowers to Ellie, his future mother in law, who proceeds to get really like passive aggressive about how at least someone's giving her flowers to Manny. Like while Julian's there, inappropriate. Now, this is the part right away where we learn that Julian calls Manny bro dad. And it's the only thing about him that makes me understand why Manny, like, doesn't want to hang out with him. Peaches and Ellie get weird and conspiratorial about how they have to go do the thing. And, oh, they're so, no, it's just a thing, you know, they gotta go do the thing. Leaving Julian and Bro Dad to hang out and Bro Dad leaves because he hates Julian. <laughs> Ellie makes some comment about how it's a special day and Manny's like, well, that was weird. I don't know what that means. So I won't ask any questions and goes about his life. The movie has been going for nine minutes. I'm already confused, upset, and bored at the same time. It's kind of impressive, but nine minutes in, we finally get Sid. We open on Sid practicing a speech to propose to his girlfriend, and once she shows up, we find out they've been on one date, and she thinks he's too clingy. He is, and she leaves. Sid sobs because he thought he'd finally found his true love and wipes away his tears with a poison ivy bikini he made her. They kind of gloss past that he made that, and the joke is just that it's poison ivy and his Face all swells up. Ha ha! Face all swollen. Sid starts yelling to Manny for help. 
Manny is not there. Am I okay? Manny's not there. I don't know why he's yelling for Manny. It takes 11 minutes of runtime just to get to Diego. He doesn't show up for 11 minutes. This movie is just over an hour and a half long. That's too long to keep Diego out of it. We find Manny and Diego at the bar drinking and talking about their women problems, of which Diego has none because his perfect scary girlfriend is out there just being scary and perfect. But Manny doesn't understand why his wife giggles sometimes. So so many problems. Sid shows up, face well, and also lamenting women and being alone. And he feels like everybody else has somebody, but he doesn't have anybody. And the boys fix up his face, but they don't do a lot to reassure him that he's not going to be alone, which feels bad. I hate that I'm probably just going to keep saying, do you remember Ice Age 1? But do you remember Ice Age 1? Manny, Diego, and Sid committed to being each other's family. It feels very weird that by the time we get to this movie, Manny's fully entrenched in his own family. Diego seems pretty satisfied to just have him and Shira most of the time, and they've just left Sid <laughs> to not be a part of any of that. I don't know. Feels bad. Feels like it kind of cheapens Ice Age 1 a little bit. Because now it's not about found family. It's about romantic love and that being what you're supposed to look for, as well as blood family issues and the insecurities with that. Not to say that they can't explore new family dynamics. I think it's important that they keep exploring new family dynamics if the core of all of this is family, but it doesn't feel like the core of it is family if you're just leaving Sid and Diego pretty much completely separate from this new group. Anyway, the next scene is Scrat. None of Scrat's scenes maintain any continuity in the slightest, so if I'm ever describing one Scrat scene, and you remember back to the last one, you're like, how, how did we get there? I don't know either. Nobody knows. In this one, Scrat finds the gravity control. It's like a knob. You can turn to be less or more gravity and he increases it 50 times and we get some of the worst visual imagery i've ever seen in a movie like all the teeth fall out of his mouth from increased gravity it's bad and then in the ultimate betrayal in 50 times gravity he is crushed by his own nut none of this affects anything back on earth we see part of the asteroid has broken the atmosphere and is hurtling towards land <laughs> we're really expected to sympathize with Manny's troubles that, quite frankly, I already think he's in the wrong for, while there's literal asteroids headed to Earth in an apocalyptic manner. Priorities. Anyway, Sid's emotionally lamenting his problems with women, and Diego carries him off, because Sid and Diego are still friends. <laughs> Ellie surprises Manny with a big party. It's their anniversary! That was the special day, oh no! He forgot. Are we surprised? Are we surprised that he forgot? No. The asteroid breaks atmosphere and breaks apart into fireworks. It's just fully fireworks. It looks exactly like fireworks. There are fireworks happening. And Ellie thinks, oh my God, are those for me? You lit up the whole sky for me? And he goes, yeah, babe, I did. Sid and Manny both think the other one made the fireworks happen. I don't know what Manny sees in Sid that he thinks He's like good at advanced pyrotechnics, but I guess it's nice that somebody respects him that way. Either way, Ellie loves it. Ellie loves it. She's so happy. I love Ellie. I love seeing her happy. This was nice for a second. We cut over to Diego and Shira. They're hanging out near a bunch of children talking about how they want kids, but they scare kids. I mentioned all this earlier. They do have a cute line in this scene where Shira says that someday when their future kid is out there with everybody else, they're gonna be the best one. That's cute. Like their one disagreement is Diego thinks their kid's gonna be a he and Shira thinks it's gonna be a she. Like they're so healthy and communicative. Uh, this scene also has probably what I would call the only good joke of the movie. There's other parts that I laughed, but I think this one is the only one that I would call like a good joke that I actually had a real laugh at. So these two are sitting around talking about how kids are scared of them. Ugh, but why? Why are kids scared of us? We love kids. And then it cuts to a genuinely unsettling wide shot from where the kids are, where you can see in all this green lighting from the fireworks, back behind the bushes, two tigers with these big reflective eyes and their, their fangs all, all lit up, just staring back at the kids. 
And it's funny because it's genuinely kind of scary to look at. Like, it's, it's a moment where they're like, oh, why are they so scared? And then you cut to what the kids see and it's like, oh, I get it. <laughs> and then, you know, the kids run away screaming and she was like, but I even smiled this time. Shira, I love you. I, I love, I wish you were in the movie. In the background, Crash and Eddie are eating so much food. <laughs> While everyone is talking about how cool Manny's gift was, Julian spills that he and Peaches are planning on traveling the world instead of immediately moving next to Ellie and Manny like they said they were going to. <gasps> Manny pitches a whole big fit. Pitches a whole big fit and says that Julian isn't part of his family yet. That's mean. While Manny is having this big hissy fit, Diego, one of the only reasonable ones in the movie, has noticed that asteroids are falling to Earth and is trying to get Manny to pay attention to that. Instead, once he finally gets Manny to care about that, Manny tells everybody to run, and there's kind of a genuinely tense scene of everybody in this valley running away from asteroids that are, like, ripping down trees and starting fires, and eventually they get into a little cave. I mean, the possums are making bad jokes the whole time, and at the end, Sid is facing a meteor as it falls, and when he turns around, all the fur is burned off of the front of him, and his nipples are glowing. It's... I don't like it. We're now 21 minutes into the movie. We've got the space stuff happening. We have all the family stuff in the valley happening. There's asteroids falling to Earth. You would think we'd keep focusing on either of those already disjointed plot lines. You'd be wrong. You'd be wrong. Now, in Ice Age 3, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, whatever year it came out, we find out that under like a foot thick sheet of ice under the valley is an entire other world where all the dinosaurs are still alive. They never went extinct. They went underground. Now, did it make for kind of a fun movie premise in the third movie? Yes, it did. I think they should have left it there because the more they reference that the dinosaurs are down there, the less it makes sense. There's like vegetation down there. There's plants. How, how, how? How'd the sun get down there? How is there any light down there? How is anything functioning down there? How did this happen? Why are they all underground? Why is it a secret that they're all underground? How did not everybody know that there were dinosaurs three feet under them the whole time? Anyway, 21 minutes into this movie, it's dinosaur time, which means I now get to add more characters to the board. Down in dinosaur time, we see a trio of dinosaurs all trying to get an egg, presumably to eat. This one is named Gavin. He's the dad of the other two. He's voiced by Nick Offerman for some reason. And his primary personality trait is disapproving father, which they do play mostly just for laughs, which does mean he's a great comedic effect character, which is so good because we don't have enough comic relief in this cast. He doesn't deserve to be by Diego, but I honestly don't have that much room. Gavin, the dinosaur's daughter, is named Gertie. Her shtick is that she's big and strong, even though she's girl. Um, so she is also very funny, which is so good because we don't have enough comic relief in the cast. Gavin loves Gertie because Gavin values strength as an asset. Uh, he sees Gertie as what his children should be, which then brings us to Roger. As you can probably tell by his character design, Roger is skinny and scrawny and he doesn't want to steal eggs. He wants to be a smart, good boy. And his clash with his sister and his father is kind of an emotional beat they're in like the whole movie we're gonna say his primary personality trait is please love me dad which does work into the entire theming of ice age being about family issues but i don't think we needed to bring in an entire other family unit to bring any of these themes home gavin is a bad dad he's a bad dad he eventually sees the errors of his ways because it's a children's movie but after Diego's arc in the first movie with his objectively bad family that he broke away from, I don't understand why we need this dinosaur trio. I don't know why they're here. I think the movie would be better if they weren't here. And I want every time that I have to keep bringing up this dinosaur trio because they keep being in it, I want you to think about how that time could have been spent developing anything else happening. Now, who stops them from stealing the dinosaur egg to presumably eat? Well, oh my god, is it the star of Ice Age 6 Adventures of Buck 2022? I don't like Buck very much. <laughs> he was fine in Ice Age 3, and I think he should have stayed in Ice Age 3. This is partially because Buck's primary personality trait is crazy. 
and it's just mm, they do use Buck to sneak past a few jokes that I don't actually think needed to be in this movie. Uh, it's not Buck's fault, right? He's just a character, but I don't I didn't like much of his screen time and he gets a lot of screen time. Buck has to live over here by himself. Buck's introduction is him singing a song and then running around saving the egg, fully defying physics in every way. Uh, and I don't, I didn't like it very much. I didn't like it very much. It didn't set me up to enjoy Buck very much. Throughout this entire movie, Buck just has superpowers. He completely defies physics. He can conjure any item that he wants. Uh, in his opening, he triggers a explosion and rock slide that makes a cliff shape like his face. He can pretty much fly. He has a mind palace and weird telepathy. Uh, that he inflicts upon the other possums at some point, kind of against their will. It's a little bit weird. Basically, when Buck is on screen, there are no stakes. You cannot be worried about what's going to happen to Buck because he can just magic his way out of it. And nobody seems to think it's weird. Buck's just over here wringing himself out like a washcloth. And everybody else who follows regular gravity and anatomical proportions just looks over like, <laughs> that's Buck. Anyway, Buck saves the egg and then he falls into a hole. We're all falling into holes this movie and he finds a big obelisk with a prophecy written on it. Obviously, when he's approaching this obelisk, he steps on a pressure plate and the design on this pressure plate is an acorn. So I guess the implication is there was an advanced alien species who's visited the planet who were just really into nuts. I don't really like that as an explanation, but I think it's the only explanation for why this pressure plate with a nut design was there and why Scrat just managed to activate everything by putting an acorn on it. It's just not very secure. Anyway, the hometown of all the other characters has been completely destroyed by asteroids. And then Buck comes out of a hole in the ground after a weird fake out where they try to make you think it's gonna be a monster even though you saw Buck two minutes ago. It's bad. Another thing about Buck is he calls everybody else mammals all the time. Buck is a mammal, and I get that he lives with dinosaurs and doesn't see mammals very often, but, like, he's also a mammal. It's just a weird thing he calls the group of them. He walks around and harasses Shira because he's never met Shira before. Julian calls his eye patch uh, very gangsta, which, um... And then he tells everybody that they're doomed and references the big obelisk he dragged up from underground. You all know the, the big prophecy obelisk. And according to the prophecy obelisk, there have already been two major extinction events caused by asteroids. There was the one with the dinosaurs and there was one before the dinosaurs. Though obviously, it didn't stick for the dinosaurs. They do have to address that, by the way, later on. They're like, but this time we can't go underground like the dinosaurs did. Like, how did the dinosaurs do to go underground? Did they see the obelisk? Anyway, on the obelisk, it shows that the asteroid always hits the exact same spot at, like, the base of a mountain. Also, in images on the obelisk, we see, like, the little trilobite area where the first extinction event was, and then the dinosaur one, and then the mammal one that's presumably coming up. And in the, in the mammal one, there's silhouettes of a mammoth and a sloth and a little tiger. Like, Manny and Sid and Diego are just... We're, were foretold by prophecy? Uh, nobody brings that up, by the way. Nobody brings up the fact that all their silhouettes are on the obelisk. It's fine, we didn't even notice, probably. So the plan that they devise is to go to that spot of impact. And that's it, that's the plan. But it doesn't matter, because then there's a weird cross-dressing joke from Buck, and then the possums make a joke about duty, because it sounds like duty, get it? <laughs> Buck tells them all how much time they have until the apocalypse, and he knows it down to the second. How? Because he's magic. And then Julian falls down again. Ha ha ha! And then the dinosaurs come up from Dino Land looking for Buck because he stole their egg. The dinosaurs actually find out about the asteroid coming and Gavin's cool plan is that it won't affect them because they can fly. Why would an asteroid hitting the world affect them? They're fine. We, got, we gotta go get the guy that stole our egg. That's actually funny that he thinks that and I wish they'd spent more time on that because that's funny and I think this movie would be better if it was funny. We're 32 minutes into the movie and they're making us look at Scrat again. Things are finally happening down on Earth Place and they send us back to Scrat. 
somehow gravity got better. I don't know. I didn't ask. There's two minutes of weird shenanigans in teleporters. He gets spliced with stuff. Aha! He ends up in a toilet. I don't know. The nut gets flushed out into space. We're back on Earth now. Peaches and Julian are having a conversation about how because the world is ending, they might not actually get to get married, which is tragic for them because they really thought that they kind of knew what their life was going to look like and that they were going to be together and be in love and have a future. But that's uncertain now. And she just wants to make sure that he knows that she still loves him no matter what, even if they never actually get to that step of their life. Um, and then we cut over to Sid saying that he'll plan the wedding for him. Don't even worry about it. The extra weird thing about that is it does kind of point out that Sid seems to be the most supportive father figure that Peaches has. And I think that's just because Peaches and Diego, I don't think, talk once in this movie. Uh, but Peaches and Sid do. And Sid actually wants Peaches to have what she wants. You know, he wants her to be happy and have her wedding and have her life. And the man he's over there pouting because falls down a lot, doesn't know sports keeps falling down and doesn't know anything about sports. Literally while Sid and the possums are like modeling hair and outfit options for peaches for her wedding, Manny is walking behind them mocking Julian's mannerisms loudly, out loud, to Ellie, mocking his daughter's fiance, his future son-in-law. He, ca <laughs> he calls him Mr. No Plans Bouncy Walk, which <laughs> Manny straight up wants to destroy the relationship between his daughter and this guy. Uh, Ellie just wants to convince them to not move away um, and to do it in a way that convinces Peaches it was her idea the whole time because th that's how you get her to do stuff, I guess, is you manipulate her into thinking it was her choice. While on this fraught family walk, Buck finds a space rock. Between the weasel and the possums, they find out that the space rocks are magnetic and they're doing a bunch of shenanigans about it. And then King, the only one who I ever care what he has to say in the background goes, oh good, so we have something to play with in our final hours. Which, yeah, I'd be mad too. <laughs> uh, but to point out that that's not actually what he's doing here, Buck teleports Crash and Eddie into his mind palace. I don't have a better way to describe what he does. He touches them on the head and then all three of them are in a big white void where Buck and different versions of Buck are here to explain what Buck has figured out. Not to all the characters or in a way that is helpful for everybody, but just to explain to Crash and Eddie what he knows. The Mind Palace does have Neil deGrasse Tyson but a weasel. Like it's a weasel who looks like Neil deGrasse Tyson and also Pythagoras, but a weasel and also a, a robot that's a weasel. So basically he just explains that the asteroid is attracted to magnets. So if they want to move where the asteroid hits, they have to move the magnets, which I, I don't think that's science, but at this point, sure. Yep, it's all magnets. It's good that they found the space rocks because before they truly didn't have a plan. They were just going to go to where the asteroid hits and just be right where the asteroid hits. That feels like the worst place to be. Oh no, the dinosaurs saw them and Buck hasn't told anybody else that he's being chased by dinosaurs because why would he inform them of an active danger? So instead he just reroutes them into a forest where the flying dinosaurs can't see them as well. Smart. It was at about this point in the movie where I realized Buck is the main character of Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016. He wasn't in the first chunk of the movie, but from the second he did appear, he had all the answers, knew exactly how to navigate the plot, is the only one who knows how to navigate the plot, and is the only one magic enough to figure it out. Everyone else is just here to do exactly what Buck says. In small doses, he's fine. He's fine, but they've made him the main character. The other thing about situating Buck as the thing driving the plot forward in this story is Buck does not have anything to do with any of the family issues, with any family themes. He's just a guy. He travels alone, works by himself, is perfectly happy that way, does not need companionship or family dynamics. Anyway, the amount that Buck is present is detrimental to the movie <laughs> as a whole and is why I will not be watching Ice Age 6 Adventures of Buck 2022. I can't do it. Now, the herd reaches a river. 
And the only one asking the right questions asks, how are we going to get around the river now, Weasel Man? Uh, and Weasel Man consults the tablet. The prophecy. Instead of, like, building a boat. We're 40 minutes into the movie and we're back in space. Strat has now mostly learned how to operate the spaceship and he's figured out how to use the tractor beam, which he wants to try and use to, you know, get the nut back because he accidentally flushed it out the dang ship. But instead, his tractor beam grabs the moon. It, it grabs the moon and it moves the moon. And you know how moon affects tides, okay? So when Scrat grabs Moon and moves it, all the water in the river that the, the herd is by rises into a big arch. And they can all safely walk beneath it like some sort of Moses moment. So thanks to the tractor beam and the newly positioned Moon, they safely get across under the river but then, uh, Scrat, his tractor beam hits Jupiter and grabs some of the storm at the big red spot, great red spot, the big spot on Jupiter and pulls the storm. Okay, with the tractor beam, you following, he reached all the way out to Jupiter and it pulls the storm and sends it right down to the <gasps> forest that the herd is in. What? I'm going to kind of skim over the next scene. There's a big electrical storm in the forest now. All the static makes some of them poofy. Ellie and Manny make a lot of comments about how staying close keeps us alive, you know, where peaches can hear them. Whatever. There's a big lightning storm and some shenanigans. Manny and Ellie get trapped trying to save peaches after she's already saved herself. Diego saves their dumb asses. They all get out of there. The only, like, funny thing that happens in that scene is Granny gets hit by lightning and, like, falls to the ground in a crisp and then gets immediately hit by lightning again and keeps walking like nothing ever happened. That was funny. I think that was good. After they safely get out of the very dangerous forest, Buck starts panicking and saying he heard a baby and goes back into the forest. Um, we at no point heard or saw a baby, so it's... Very weird that he's doing this, but also he's magic. So you just kind of have to assume at any point that he's doing something that makes sense, even when it doesn't make sense. Uh, and it doesn't make sense. He comes out of the forest with a pumpkin that he names Bronwyn. It's just a pumpkin. It stays a pumpkin the whole movie, uh, but it's his child now. And he calls it Bronwyn. Which is definitely not a concerning behavior. They all keep walking, but Diego notices a burning feather, and now he's suspicious. So Diego notices that. He holds it in his brain. He's not going to make any accusations or anything yet. He doesn't have any more evidence. He's not going to start yelling at people or doing miscommunications or anything like that because he's always right. And instead what he does is goes and bonds with Julian, and they're just laughing and having a good time because Diego is supportive. You know who hates that? You know who absolutely hates that Diego and Julian get along at all? Manny. Because how dare Diego not notice that this guy's not good enough for Manny's little girl. I hate it so much. I really do. Now, this is the part of the movie where Julian helps get the campfire going for the night. And while he's doing that, is singing some of the lyrics to Fall Out Boy's My Songs Know What You Did in the Dark. So the right tune, the right lyrics, they're not altered at all, which begs the question, is Fall Out Boy canon in the Ice Age universe? You have to assume yes, right? If the mammoths know the songs. We never see Fall Out Boy, and why not? In the show Arcane, there's a random Imagine Dragons cameo just because Imagine Dragons sings the intro theme song. I don't know why I couldn't have gotten to see Patrick Stump as a little weird ancient beaver. It would have paid for some of their sins. You could have even had him in a little hat. Come on. Come on. It's like actively choosing not to make the movie better at that point. But Fall Out Boy will not come to save us. And instead, we listen to Ellie and Manny scheme about how to influence their daughter to not travel the world the way that she wants to with her fiancé. 
and to instead stay safe and next to them forever. Manny's part of the scheming is to get Julian out of the way for a little while, which he does by offering to play hockey with him the way he was with Peaches at the beginning, because he knows how badly Julian wants his approval and that like connection uh, and uses that to get Julian away, in which you believe it, Julian falls down and doesn't know sports. Aha! And while they're gone, Ellie starts testing Peaches' survival instincts and parenting instincts? Peaches has not mentioned wanting kids. <laughs> They've just talked about wanting to get married and wanting to travel. Uh, this is a big assumption on Ellie's part, but either way, Peaches does great. Absolutely aces the test because she's incredible. Back over in hockey, Manny's obviously winning a whole lot and genuinely does play the card like, oh, you guys didn't move. We could do this all the time. We could do this all the time, Julian. Don't you want a father figure? Don't you want your fiance's dad to like you? Uh, and then when Julian makes a comment to Peaches, now that she's done with her weird test, about how uh, he can be her new hockey partner while they're traveling, Manny gets so mad and hits a puck so hard that it hits Julian in the face and he passes out. Do you know how hard you have to hit a mammoth in the face for them to pass out? I don't either, but I bet it's pretty hard. And then Diego walks up and says it's a mystery why the kids want to move away. King, king, king. Peaches really lays out her boundaries and tells her parents that it doesn't matter what they do, her and Julian are going to live their lives how they want to, and kind of storms off and leaves them thinking about what they've done. Roger the dinosaur goes to steal Buck and bring him back to his father and sister, making some comments about wishing he had a loving father. I get it. Family issues, daddy issues, they've all got them. Okay. Uh, but he doesn't steal Buck. He steals Granny. When Granny wakes up from being stolen, she thinks the dinosaurs are angels. But once they start being mean to her, she calls them bad angels and starts fighting them. Uh, but then Gavin eats her. Okay. And then Granny starts punching him from the inside and making some comments about how she can see the light that she's going towards. And it's, you're just sitting there watching thinking, okay, so she's going to come out of the dinosaur. How? Uh, she gets thrown up. She gets thrown up by the dinosaur, but it is a very weird it's Vor in the middle, in the middle of the kids movie. There's just like, it's, it's Vor and it, it just didn't need to happen. None of that needed to happen. Not even a little bit. Granny gets thrown into a pit. I wish I cared. In the morning, Buck realizes they have less time than he thought they did. And Sid starts looking for his grandmother. Weird. Buck finally reveals that they've been tailed by dinosaurs. Diego gets to have like, oh, I knew something was up moment. But why so heavily show him noticing the feather if he didn't get to do anything about whatever? Uh, Diego does get to track Granny's scent to try and find where she went. So, you know, King being helpful. He tracks Granny's scent all the way to what remains of the last asteroid that fell, the last extinction event that killed the dinosaurs. Uh, but then he loses the scent and Sid starts mourning his grandmother, the only blood family he has left. And then they hear Granny crying in pain from inside the asteroid. Now this is the crystal cult section of the movie. This is the part with the crystal cult. The crystal cult is called Geotopia, but it is essentially a group of people living inside of the asteroid, being kept eternally young forever by magic crystals inside of the asteroid. And they're like a little cult. In this cult, we have a blue bunny who was giving Granny a massage. And that's why she was making those sounds because they hurt so good, I guess. Uh, they're like a thing, the two of them. And we also have Brooke. This is Brooke. Brooke is a sloth. And I would like to point you to her design. This dress, it's not a dress. It's her fur. It's her fur. And Brooke falls instantly, head over heels, in love with Sid the Sloth. This is like an hour into the movie, by the way. Oh, I hate the crystal cult. Okay, so Brooke brings them all 
to the leader of the crystal cult after they let her know that there's an impending apocalyptic danger. The leader of the crystal cult is called the Shangri Lama. The Shangri Lama is voiced by Jesse Tyler Ferguson, and he also calls the herd mammals, like the way Buck does. Okay. He makes them all do yoga while he explains the situation to them. Their proposed solution is to launch Geotopia into space uh, to attract the asteroid away because it's got all the magnets in it. And remember, that's how science works, is asteroids just go wherever magnets are, right? The Shangri-Lama starts basically assaulting Diego. And it's like a massage, but it's very much Diego doesn't like it or want it. And he didn't ask. And he's just hurting Diego while explaining that he won't let them go through with their plan and save the world and that Geotopia has to stay right where it is. I don't like this movie. So plan thwarted, they're all gonna die. Peaches is devastated. Her and Julian have another moment where they come to this realization that the life that they've planned and want to have together is not going to happen that they're not going to get it, that the world is going to end and they're not gonna get a chance to have what they thought they were going to have. And it's really sad. <laughs> While they're having this conversation, Julian tells her that he's so excited to have his life flash before his eyes before he dies so that he can fall in love with her all over again and get to see what they did have together as sort of the last thing that he gets to experience. Julian's great. Like, these two are great. These two are also great, but they're not in the movie. These two, who we do focus on quite a bit, are wonderful together. And it makes everything Manny does feel bad. <laughs> like, you're supposed to know that he's being unreasonable, but he's being so unreasonable. And we really have no reason to think that Peaches and Julian won't be fine. And in fact, while they're having this really sad conversation, Manny gets really sad that he's never going to get to see his daughter leave home and have her own life. And he realizes that he's been really unreasonable. And he and Ellie kind of sit and mourn Earth and, and reflect on what they have had together. It's heavy, but it doesn't really have any weight in the movie we've been given. Uh, there's still about half an hour of movie left, so we know there's going to be something going on. Everything else that's happened has been so surface level and so fleeting. We don't really get to feel what's happening here, which is such a shame because it's it could have been good. These moments, these two moments, could have held a lot of weight, and they don't. And while they're doing that, Sid and Brooke are in love in the corner and agree to get married right away in a parallel of Sid's girlfriend at the beginning saying she won't get married because it's only been one date. Brooke pops the question and then Sid says, oh, we need a ring. We need a diamond because of course they do. Sid ignores all of Brooke's warnings and tries to pull a crystal off the wall. And when he does so, the entire crystal cult civilization collapses. This is a kind of effect we normally only get with Scrat, where he pushes nut into something and everything breaks apart. But over here, Sid pulled part of a wall and every wall in the place falls down. And when all the walls fall down, that eternal youth that Brooke and everyone else here has been benefiting from is gone. <laughs> uh, Brooke gets old, the blue bunny that Granny thought was hot is old so she doesn't think he's hot anymore. And everybody acts like it's really weird that the Shangri Lama is mad about this. They think he's being really unreasonable for being upset at all. I'd be mad. I'd be mad. Are you kidding? Like he's pacing around ranting and angry and like spitting and I would be furious. I'd be furious if I was a cool cult leader leading a great little civilization and one dude touching one wall ruined everything. Yes, I would be angry. Buck, seeing the angry llama, is now inspired to use the volcano to launch all the crystals into space to divert the asteroid. Yeah, there's a volcano there. I didn't know that before Buck started talking about it. It's just been there the whole time. It's just right behind where the asteroid landed, of course. What is a mountain if not a volcano? 
Brooke gives a whole speech about change being necessary and let's do it. Woo! Launch the crystal! It is a whole team effort. The herd and all the crystal cult members are bringing them crystals up to the top of the mountain to dump into the volcano. The plan is to then seal up all the pressure vents around so that all the pressure builds up and eventually they're forcing an eruption, essentially. Sounds safe uh, to get all the crystals into the atmosphere, into space. Hard to say how far they think they're gonna go. Buck makes a comment about how they're ahead of schedule and then we immediately cut back into space. Scrat is now an expert at the spaceship. He's got on cool guy sunglasses. He does like the little stick shift. He's got it. He's gonna fix it. And he goes up to the asteroid and then fucks up and pushes it closer to Earth. <laughs> Why did he do that? Why does it matter? We will never know. Now there is still the biggest crystal, the biggest bit of crystal that's like gonna tip him over the edge of this working, right? And they're, they're all working to get it up the mountain, and then these three idiots show up. It takes so little for Buck to convince Gavin that they will all die if the asteroid hits. It is comical how short amount of a time it takes, and like not in a way that the movie wanted it to be funny. Roger gets his big I told you so moment. He gets to convince Gertie to help out. All three of them decide that they are going to help by lifting the big crystal to the top of the mountain for them. And Buck calls himself a father because he has a child that's a pumpkin. I hate. So the dinosaurs bring up the big section of crystal right up to the top, and then they get struck by a meteor. Obviously. Uh, so then the big crystal is kind of waiting on the edge. So it's all down to Manny and Julian. Julian insists that they do it together. They have like a little bonding moment about it. Diego gets everybody else to safety while these two take their sweet time. Shira does get to do something. She gets Granny to safety, so. Glad you were here, Shira. Julian does a cool trick shot with the big crystal that launches it into the bowl of the volcano. Manny just has to trust him. Manny just has to trust this guy that he doesn't know that's gonna steal his daughter. But he does, he does trust him. And it works, and the crystal gets in there, and then Manny says, I take back everything I've ever said about you. Julian did not know that Manny had said mean things about him. So that was weird. And now they just wait to see if it worked. And Granny plugs the last pressure vent, and it explodes! The asteroid still hurtles towards them, and just kind of skims them, and then goes back up towards the magnet crystals. And it's weirdly anticlimactic, and it has to be, right? If the entire climax is based around something not happening, it's always gonna feel a little off, I think, especially in a children's action adventure comedy movie. You want your climax to be something happening, right? The heroes narrowly avoiding something and then they realize they're gonna be okay even. This is just something happening around them. They're standing still. It doesn't feel right. <laughs> anyway, they all celebrate because they're alive and Manny calls Julian his family. So I guess he got over some stuff. Uh, when everybody goes to head back, Brooke reveals that she's going to stay behind and that Granny is also going to stay behind and they're all gonna be old together. Brooke calls Sid her true love. They've known each other three hours by now, I wanna say. Uh, Granny makes some weird comments about naked bingo and telling the bunny that he can't kiss her on the lips and then they're all off. And wouldn't that be a nice conclusion for these two? Wouldn't that be where we should leave them, right? No. The magnets come back, and when the magnets come back, the eternal youth is reactivated in the spring they're all bathing in, so they're all young again, including Granny. It's the Fountain of Youth Ice Age now canonically has a Fountain of Youth and we just all have to accept that. We just all have to accept that as canon in the last 15 minutes of the fifth movie in the franchise. The last scene on Earth is the big wedding. Peaches and Julian get to get married. After all of that, after all of that stress, they do get to get married. And like I mentioned way at the beginning of this section, 
it looks like a Christian wedding. Everybody's like standing in pews. She gets walked down the aisle. There's an officiant. She's got a veil. It's weird, I think. I'm not saying it's not effective in storytelling because it's what their audience, American children primarily, recognizes as a wedding. I'm just saying that I think it's weird. I think it's weird. Peaches is nervous. She's talking about how she doesn't want to leave her parents, even though, you know, she spent the whole movie saying she does. Uh, they're a little bit closer now from all of this. And, you know, she's nervous. It's a big step for her. And Manny tells her the story about the first time they played hockey and how he knew when it was the right time to let her go, which is sweet. Sid is the wedding planner, by the way. He did manage to land himself that gig. I'm super proud of him. I love that for Sid. Diego and Shira are hanging out at the wedding and kids approach them to ask them about how they saved the world. And they start telling an over-embellished story, adding in fantastical details about, I think, zombies, if I remember right. Uh, and it's cute. It's cute. Uh, it's, a, it's a nice way to cap off their storyline that was mentioned right at the beginning. Never again for about an hour and 20 minutes and then is brought back right again uh, at the very end. So that's fun. I really can't get over how they just put a regular modern human wedding at the end of this movie. The possums are flower girls. Manny gives peaches away. Here comes the bride is playing. Like, again, I get it. Because the audience sees all that and goes, ah, wedding. We know all of those things to mean wedding. I just, it's, is it not, is it not weird? Is it not a little, is it not a little weird, right? I'm not crazy. Right after they are officially married in the eyes of mammoth Jesus or whatever, Brooke shows up. She does the dirty dancing lift on Sid and then drops him and then sings a whole ballad about how much she loves Sid in the middle of Peach's wedding. There's a whole dance number after this because bad children's movies end with dance numbers, but I think it should have ended with Peach's just fully cussing out Brooke for hijacking her wedding after she just went through all of that? No. Also, the dinosaurs are at the wedding. I don't think I personally would have invited them, but I guess good for peaches. And then Sid invents the tradition of the father of the bride paying for the wedding, and they walk off. And that's where we leave the herd. That's it. Of course, that's not it for the movie because they can't just let me rest. Instead, we go back into Neil deGrasse Tyson voiceover. And he's talking about Mars and how Mars used to be suitable for life. And as Mr. Dr. Tyson is explaining all of this, Scrat crash lands into Mars and immediately the entire planet is dry and desolate. Scrat then gets out of the rocket ship, surveys the damage, gets back in, and leaves. And that is the end of the movie, except of course it isn't. There's a post credits scene. The post credits scene is just Scrat getting squished by automatic doors a bunch of times. That's it. And that's the movie. I didn't like the movie very much. Before I get into some things that I think the movie could have done differently to be decent, uh, at least, I want to quickly go over things that Scrat canonically is the cause of in the Ice Age universe. Because I totally forgot to go over this in my plot recap. I think in the very first Scrat scene, where he was launched into space, he was bouncing around and hitting the planets like bowling balls. Like, specifically, the, the visual was bowling. Um, so he is canonically responsible for the alignment of all of the planets in the solar system. And in this sequence, he also gives Saturn its rings. So... That's pretty cool of him. He also caused the asteroid falling to Earth, which I guess makes him an integral part of the Prophecy Obelisk. Remember Prophecy Obelisk? Uh, except Scrat's not anywhere on Prophecy Obelisk. He also gave Earth the moon. It's still difficult for me to tell if the imagery wanted me to believe that Scrat caused Jupiter's red spot to be a storm or if he just moved it. I've had some debates about that with people. He did take whatever effect he did there to make an electrical storm on Earth, which is not as Big of a thing is the alignment of all the planets in the solar system, but it is a crazy thing that he did. Uh, and he is also the sole reason that Mars is uninhabitable by all life. In a crash that didn't even damage his spaceship. 
all that to say, I think they really didn't have to do any of that with Scrat. I think all of the time that we spent with Scrat was just time away from the dynamics of the insane amount of characters they had to juggle in this movie. But obviously you can't get rid of Scrat. It's an Ice Age movie. You need to have Scrat. He needs to be doing silly things. They need to be upping the stakes. I get it, sure. So whatever script doctoring you want to do, you have to keep Scrat. We can even put him in space. Fine. I just think there should have been less of it. There also should have been less incredibly disturbing imagery. Uh, I mentioned in the gravity portion the, like, teeth being pulled out of his mouth. He went flat in the splicing teleporter incident he was having. Some of that was really bad to look at. I don't know why they did all of that. And I think we could have done with less. Like, do kids like that? I didn't like that when I was a kid. Is that something that kids generally enjoy? Not to say I was a child when this movie came out. I was 16. I was past their demographic, which is why I never saw it in theaters. But I didn't like that shit when I was a kid kid either. So, you know who else this movie could have used a little bit less of? Fuck. But we needed him to explain the whole plot. Otherwise, it wouldn't have had a plot. Okay. Okay. I could much more easily forgive Buck's insane amount of omniscience and involvement if it did not mean that these three were around the whole time. I think, I think any script doctrine cuts these three out immediately. We don't need them. <laughs> any plot furthering that happened because these three were present did not happen because those three were present. It didn't. It happened because a different effect was happening upon those three that then changed what happened here. Like, the presence of this trio brought everybody else into that forest for the electrical storm to happen. But that didn't have to be why. The path could have just gone into a forest, right? It's a movie. You can just say there was just one path, or say that was the faster path. Make it clear that, like, everyone else wanted to go forward, but that's the long way. And we need to go the short way. That's, that's fine. That's easier. Granny did not need to get stolen by them. She could have just slipped off a cliff at some point or gone up for a walk in the middle of the night because she's like that and ended up inside of the asteroid. Or they all could have just found the asteroid by walking to the mountain. It was at the base of the mountain. We didn't need some weird plot happenstance to get them there. They were already, they were already going there. They were already going there. Why did we have to make it a whole little adventure to get there and make Sid mourn his grandmother? These three also did not need to carry that final crystal up to the top because it's their fault that it fell down to where it fell down in the first place. They caused the problem, and then they were the solution. That's a weird little cul-de-sac. You just cut that out. Basically, I hate these dinosaurs, and I want them gone. And with them gone, we have more room for Shira to be in the movie. Shira's cool. Shira is very cool. And her and Diego, one of the supposedly main characters have a very good, healthy, and serious relationship. They're talking about their future. They want kids. You know who doesn't want kids, as far as we know? Peaches. You know who's still got a weird talk about parenting instincts and how hard it is? Peaches. Shira should have been present for that talk. She should have been a part of that situation. Make her nervous. Make her doubt herself a little bit. Or make Shira pregnant in the movie. Heighten the danger of the fact that she's here. Her and Diego can have some squabbles about it. Is that exactly what these two did in Ice Age 3, Dawn of the Dinosaurs, whatever year that came out? Yes, it was. Would it be a clear rehash of that exact issue? Yes, it would. I would much rather them sort of retread on an idea different characters went through for new characters than just have those characters exist for no reason. Shira could have stayed home in this movie. She could have stayed home and nothing would have changed. Granny wouldn't have gotten carried away by Shira at the very end, but you know who else could have carried Granny? Any of them. She's not very big. I guess what I'm saying is this movie really suffers from the size of its cast. There are too many characters here and too many of them don't have anything to do for large portions of the movie, if not the whole movie. And honestly, I think the easiest way to fix everything would have been to separate Manny and Sid and Diego from the rest of the group near the beginning. 
If, while the initial asteroid falls and destroys the valley, everyone makes it safely into the cave, but these three get sectioned off somehow and they end up somewhere else separated, suddenly we're dealing with three characters instead of all of this. Buck can still appear with the answer. He doesn't have to be followed by the dinosaurs during it. He can still appear with the prophecy obelisk because we love our nut prophecy obelisk, I guess. There were only three silhouettes on the obelisk. Manny, Sid, Diego. This could have been another adventure with just the three of them needing to solve a problem. They would still have all the pressure of these other characters who are now part of their herd back at home, separate, relying on them to get this done, but we wouldn't be weighed down by having a million characters in every scene. And the three of them could talk to each other. Diego could talk about how he and Shira are worried they won't be good parents, and Manny could reassure him that he didn't think he'd be a good parent either, but Peaches turned out great. And Sid could talk about how he's worried he'll be alone forever, and the other two could reassure him that he'll always have the herd. And they could talk about how the herd is still even expanding. Julian's here, and maybe Manny could get weird about it because he doesn't super love Julian, and Diego probably would be the one to tell him it's a good thing to accept more people into the herd, that Julian, as far as we can tell, doesn't seem to have family outside of these people. He needs them. He needs a family the way that these three needed a family when they all first met, when we first met them. I don't think it would be hard for Sid and Diego to make Manny see Julian as another scared young man looking for his place in the world. That's super relatable for Manny. Presumably, that would connect Manny back to who he was even before the first movie, right? Before he lost everything and got jaded and scared and paranoid and overprotective. That's who Julian is now. They could bring in that part of Manny's life and give him a chance to express that he doesn't want what happened to him to happen to anybody else. He wants people to live the life that he thought he was going to have. And that's why he wants to save the world. In this scenario, where it's just the three of them and, I guess, Buck for a little while, maybe all of it if he has to, uh, we would even be able to keep Crystal Cult. Because with less characters in every scene, we would have more time to spend in Crystal Cult. Let Manny and Sid and Diego be the ones to convince the people in charge that change is good and important. Let them realize that the family that they've made for themselves is still changing and that that's a good thing. They could even extend an offer to the people of Geotopia to have a place in their herd if they want it. To explain that it's not that life has to end just because what they have now can't keep going. Because they have to sacrifice this to save everybody else. Sid and Brooke can still fall in love if we need to have Brooke, if we need to have that. But let Sid be the one to convince the Shangri Lama and hey, Maybe we give the llama a different name in this one. Just a thought. Maybe Sid and Brooke go on a little adventure outside of it, and too far away from the crystals, Brooke loses the eternal youth just because, and realizes that that's okay, and that it was worth it to get to see more of the world, and to meet new people, and to find a new place in the world. They could convince llama man new name together in that scenario. We could even have cutaways back to everybody else back in the valley trying to patch up the damage. Maybe they don't know there's another asteroid coming, or maybe they do. And I think the way I'm describing this makes it sound really, like, dark and heavy. But uh, this is very much something you could do in a children's movie. Throw in your goofs and your gags. Have them poof up in an electrical storm, and the possums eat too much food, and they keep messing up the repairs, and maybe they're doing it to make Ellie laugh, and... Peaches and Julian are still being cute in the background, and Shira keeps accidentally scaring children. You could still have all the things that the writers seemed to want in there so badly in a structure that doesn't make me mad. After four movies where we just kept adding more and more characters to the roster, I really think this one would have benefited by going back to where we started. Have the three good, good adventure boys on an adventure. They have more things to care about now. Things have changed, but it's still at the core. The three of them and the herd that they've built and that they would do anything to protect. Instead, we got a movie where for large chunks of it, it seems like Manny barely likes anybody here. Diego's exasperated the whole time and nobody listens to him. Sid is just here to mess around and has no actual weight on the plot. And everybody else barely matters, except for Buck. And I don't even like that weasel. 
obviously I'm not a screenwriter. I don't make movies. And obviously this is a children's movie and nobody was ever supposed to get really deep into the themes of Ice Age. I get it. I know. But Ice Age 1 2002 was a movie with a theme. It was a movie that had something to say. It was a movie with a large overall cast, but a small core cast to hold it all together. And I missed that here. Ice Age 1 came out in 2002. Ice Age 2 came out in 2006, Ice Age 3 in 2009, Ice Age 4 in 2012, and Ice Age 5 in 2016. It was either three years or four years between every single movie. But Ice Age 5 Collision Course came out in 2016, and there were no plans in motion for a long time for an Ice Age 6 until Disney acquired Blue Sky Studios in 2021 with the acquisition of 21st Century Fox. This franchise died here, both a natural and painful death. But now, in 2022, almost exactly a year after their acquisition of the property, Disney is putting out a direct-to-streaming platforms Ice Age 6 featuring only one of the voice actors from this entire group. Presumably it was a contract thing. I don't think any of them were signed on for any Ice Age movies after Ice Age 5 because there wasn't supposed to be any more Ice Age movies after Ice Age 5. They ran out of ideas long before they got into the writer's room for Collision Course. They were not about to try and squeeze out any more. Please don't watch Ice Age 6 Adventures of Buckwild. That's what it's actually called. I think I've been saying it wrong this entire time because I just didn't check. I know it's not going to be good. You know it's not going to be good. And we don't need to keep parading these beloved characters' corpses out on screen to perform silly little movies. Okay? And while I'm at it, please don't watch Ice Age 5 Collision Course 2016. Why would you do that to yourself? I went through all of this trouble to explain it to you so you wouldn't have to watch it. And hey, thanks for watching that. This is my first real big for YouTube content. I had a lot of fun with it. I hope you enjoyed listening to me talk for just so, so, so long. If this goes well, if people enjoyed it and people tell me that they enjoyed it, they push all the buttons they're supposed to push and write comments about it. I love comments. Uh, I might make more YouTube content in the future. I'd like to, if that's a viable option for me. I had a lot of fun doing this. Like I said at the very beginning, the initial concept for this kind of thing was to just watch the last installment of something and kind of judge it as its own product. So if you have any recommendations for things that that would be fun for, let me know. I'd love to hear it. And just as a reminder, my name is Haley Whipjack. You can find me here or you can find me on TikTok at Whipjack. You can find me on Twitter at Whippedjack, W-H-I-P-P-E-D, Jack. Uh, let me know if you enjoyed this whole adventure and I'll see you around.